In opening government, we have high tech A. In opening opposition, we have cordial A. In closing government, we have deep voice girls. And in closing opposition, we have love, sexy, uh, nice dynamics. Uh, my name is Joe Masuda. I'll be chairing this round. To my panel, we have Tatsumi san, Poki san, and Miko san, and Pipi san. Um, the motion for this debate is this house as the West would cooperate with Russia in its military intervention in Syria. Without any further ado, I'll let's call upon the Prime Minister to make his speech on the time. Thank you. Thank you. government is going to protect two key interests of the West Western countries. Firstly, the removal of the Assad regime is actually for like, sh uh, shared interests of the Western countries, which are in, in the status quo. And secondly, also the like, removal of ICE itself, also the core interest of the Western countries shall have. We think that by cooperating with Russia, when we, we cooperate with Russia, we can, we can best achieve those two goals at the end of the day. Therefore, we are extremely proud to support this motion in today's debate. So the model we are supporting for today's debate is this. So under our proposals, we think that we should actively seeking for the cooperation with Russia. And also in the, co in the cooperations, those like West and Russia sharing the information regarding what kind of place we're going to bomb and also what uh, sharing the, the uh, and also sharing the uh, also like negotiating to, negotiating together what is the best way if but if this is an efficient way to remove uh, in the case of uh, in the, uh, we uh, we cooperate with the Russia to the intervention to the military intervention against ISIS, which Russia and the West cooperate. Russia and the West actually doing under the status quo. We think that it's actually possible cooperation with each other, and also under our model, by sharing this kind, of, this kind of two country actually sharing this kind of information, and also make sure that accountability. What kind, of, what kind of attack you're going to conduct in the Syria, uh, in the Syrian country? So that is the model we are standing for, basically in today's debate. So I'm going to talk about. Like Russia would not concede with your agreement as long as you will still demand the removal of the Assad regime. What can you say? Yes, <laughs> we'd like to think this is the secret policy that just seeking for the ISIS, <laughs> just, just seeking for the removal of ISIS, we should cooperate with the with, with cooperate with like Russia. But isn't this kind of thing is okay for possible things? So, isn't that, uh, so uh, let's talk about two points, three points of arguments. Firstly, regarding the regarding context in the status quo, how the how we can context the status quo. How like the and I like to identify two like, two little problems regarding firstly status quo. So Russian intervention, Russian inter military intervention against ISIS and other status quo actually uh, in, actually like hindered in, uh, risk intervention against risk intervention against against Syrian government, Mr. Speaker. And also also we'd like to identify the second problem at the growing power of ISIS itself. ISIS itself. So, Mr. Speaker, so first, the first problem is the Russian, uh, those, how Russia and Dallas at school hinder those kind of uh, Western intervention against uh, uh, West intervention against against Syrian government. So we think under the status quo, as we sh uh, right, 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 right now under the status quo, those like the Russian actually actively sending the military, military by saying that in order to remove ISIS, we need to conduct this kind of military intervention. But in the past, those kind of military intervention by Russia actively actively targets the anti-governmental force against the uh, anti-governmental force against Assad regime that is actively supporting under the status quo. The consequence is all that, the, those kind of like the West intervention against Syrian government actively hindered under the status quo. That's why Assad regime is actually growing in power. We cannot undermine power of the uh, We can undermine the power of the Assad regime in the status quo. We think that incredibly. We think that is actually a common problem. Uh, uh, like West actually recognizes actually incredibly problematic. But secondly, we think that uh, we, we think that second the second problem with, uh, with regards to that. We think that. Um, 
And the second layer is saying there is also the growing power of ISIS itself. So we think we're, look, let's look at the case of like terrorist attacks that actually co co actually happened in, in Paris, and also in today, also in today in the in the Britain, in the, in the Britain there the case terrorist terrorist uh, uh, in, there's there's terrorism in the train station in, today. We think that we can see actually that those threat by ISIS actually growing, and that is that. So yeah. we think this also. It's also this problem coming coming from the actually like not cooperating with Russia and not cooperating with Russia and the rest itself because we don't now rest and Russia don't cooperating with each other. That's why we cannot strategize our military intervention against ISIS. So they just separately mentally conducting military intervention from from like very different places. That's why under status quo we have failed to we have failed to have the best strategy in order to undermine the power of ISIS itself. So how we do these two? Can be can, can, uh, can be best deal, best dealt with under our proposals. So firstly, let's look at the case of uh, let's look at the ca case of like uh, West intervention against West intervention against the Assad regime. So we think under what happened under our proposals, we think that those like under under our model, Russia and the, like. Uh, Russia and the West actually have to share the information regarding what kind of military intervention, what kind of like attack you're going to conduct in the Syrian country. We'll thank you later. Syrian country. That's why the the Russia have to make sure that like, have to make sure their accountability. How, what kind of target? What kind of people they are actually targeting at, under our uh, proposal? That's why those Russian country cannot cannot, uh, cannot actively target those anti government force against. Against Syria under under our model. That's why we think that in the instance we think Russia can no longer undermine those kind of in, in, uh, undermine the interest of the West. That's removal of the sovereignty under our proposals. But for the uh, closing, all right. So we, even within the West, many countries have different geopolitical interests about Syria and ISIS. How do you reach the consensus to the extent that they can completely share the confidential information about intellectual activity with regards to ISIS and the Syrian government? We think uh, we, uh, we, agree with, we agree with we agree to some extent. But we think that it's the, also the Russian interest. So we think the removal of ISIS is actually the common interest with Russia. Russia also wants to remove the ISIS itself. That's why we think there's because like those ISIS actually like damages the Syrian government. That's why we think Russia or this we can also make sure Russia actually gives certain credible information to the West under our proposal, Mr. Speaker. That's why we believe that this is, this is personal uh, negotiation. So that's why we believe that and let's suddenly look at how this policy also effective regarding the uh, mental intervention against ISIS. So we think, as I told you in my um, first, first point, the under status quo, West and Russia is not cooperating with, um, it's not like cooperating, uh, cooperate the military intervention against ISIS, even though they have the they have the common interest of the removal of ISIS. But under uh, that's why because they separately conduct these things. That's why we cannot have the best strategy, this efficient, this efficient way to conduct military intervention under a status quo. We think given that those and um, those like power, military power is actually is not uh, now like military, military power of the United States and so on and so forth is not so strong in the, like in the past. We think it's actually necessary for us to have the best strategy to remove the ISIS to remove the ISIS. Under a policy, we can have the best strategy to to we have conduct military intervention against ISIS. That's why also the removal of ISIS that is the best inter that is the interest of the state or can be more likely to achieve the extreme powers to propose. Thank you for the Prime Minister for attending the speech. I'd like to welcome the opposition. Speaker, we should not change the partner like so easily, like Prime Minister. We think <laughs> the context, we can't trust Russia so easily because they have a malicious intent. The context in this debate is the West, more than we think the dichotomy given by the Prime Minister is totally false, like the closing opposition has already pointed out. The context in this debate is the West give up, toppling down the Assad regime, and in exchange, 
we can't cooperate with Russia. And we can't do the air bombing by cooperating with Russia and westernized yeah. countries. Given this, we think we have two arguments. First, I'll talk about, well, so this debate is about comparison between tackling ISIS between, uh, and tackling Assad regime. We are going to give you, firstly, why tackling Assad regime is more important than tackling ISIS. Second, I'll talk about why rather their policy is going to undermine fighting against ISIS. So before I do that, let's take the case of Prime Minister by three reputations. First of all, the first of all I, I, I talk about their dichotomy is different. Because if we take our policy, we have to make consensus in this debate. We have to give up tackling down Assad regime. More than that, like the thing, uniquely Russia has a malicious intent to support Assad regime. For example, in the Vietnam War, even though we have already cooperated with, even though the United States are air bombing in the in the Vietnam War, the Russia are sending the armies, sending the weapons behind the scene. We can't trust Russia so easily because they have a malicious intent to support Assad regime in the first place, even if they shake hands in the secret manner. We have, for example, in the case of Ukraine, they use the military or milita militaries suddenly and, they, uh, and suddenly and they occupy the Ukraine in the first place. We think they have a malicious intent. In the case of, for example, uniquely in the case of ISIS, they are importing, Russia is importing oil illegally and behind the scene. We can't trust Russia so easily. In the case of, for example, when you intervene as intervening the, in the Gulf War by using the United Nations military, Russia has secretly approached the Kuwait to import, expand their power in the Middle East. They expand the power in the Iran, in, in the Iraq. We think it's extremely harmful when we accept the Russians, uh, Russians, Russians' demand, and that's why necessarily harmful because it strengths the Assad regime. Secondly, they talked about when they, the Russians, the Russian level means become accountable. We think this is not, not the debate about accountability of Russia in the first place because we can't justify sending the, we can't justify supporting the anti-rebel, anti-Syrian rebel in the first place. This is not important argument. Thirdly, and our alternatives, we are more than happy to tackle the ISIS other way, for example, air bombing and sending the weapons to anti-Syrian rebel. In the case of, for example, Afghanistan, we could, could cooperate with Northern Alliance and the United States military to, um, in order to topple down the terrorist organization in Afghanistan. In the same way, we can't topple down the ISIS and the Syrian Assad regime, even though it took take, it, it's going to take a time. No, thank you. It seems to be, it seems to be difficult to topple down and completely solve problem in the Middle East. We agree with that. We think it has a possibility to take Take a time, but we think in order to do the just war, we have to topple down the ISIS and lots of regime. That's why the policy should fail. No, thank you. More than that, we can't do the air bombing because, for example, the French or NATO has already decided to air bomb ISIS strongly. They have already declared war to some extent. The current pattern. We think this is extremely radical policy if we suddenly shake hands with Russia. So first, I want to talk about why shaking, why Assad. Why, why we have to prioritize tackling Assad? We have. To, we think just because. You, just because this ISIS emerges suddenly, this doesn't mean that ISIS is an imminent threat and it's the most important problem in the Middle East in the first place. Because we have two reasons. First of all, we think the harms of ISIS is simply smaller than the Assad regime. Because it seems to be harmful to the westernized country when terrorism happens, but the casualty, in, in, in this casualty in, in, by terrorism is just, unfortunately, we have to accept the casualty is only 100, and in, for example, in the case of Paris. When the comparison, by comparatively, we think that Assad regime genocided in the past 40 years. They genocided hundreds of thousands of people and exclude, exclude, uh, exclude Sunni, and they try to exclude many people in the, in the Middle East. We think this is rather harmful, and tapping Assad is more important than ISIS. But secondly, we think we have to recognize the stability of whole Middle East, because we think other countries is also fighting against, uh, fighting against Assad. So as long as we admit Assad regime, there would be the longer conflict, for example, conflict between Jordan, Israel, and Egypt, and Syria. So we think we have, if we recognize Assad regime, it's rather longer, the st rather longer conflict in the Middle East, we think rather harmful, because we have to recognize the stability in the Middle East is rather important. We think, if you look at ISIS, we think that ISIS is not going to make a longer conflict, because they, all countries are fighting against ISIS. ISIS. We don't think this is necessarily a complex war because all countries are going to fight against ISIS. We think Assad is also should be recognized as a malicious actor in the Middle East. So second, I'm going to talk about why we think their policies rather exacerbate the situation. Uh, yes. So there are kind of 
refugees in Syria because there's a fight between Assad and ISIS. Do you think that rather stopping this dispute is a better well, solution? Well, actually, this will be my second argument why our forces rather, their forces rather exacerbate the situation of fighting against ISIS. Because first of all, within the root of causality of emerging Assad, uh, no, emerging ISIS was Assad by two ways. First of all, Assad regime destroyed the security of the meeting of Syria, and destroyed the infrastructure, and destroyed the minimum level of living in the status quo. And that's why ISIS emerged, because they have, have they give, gave a capability of ISIS to emerge in this insecurity. In insecurity. So we think that they, even if we accept that, even if we topple down the ISIS, as long as we can't destroy the Assad regime, there will be the next ISIS. Because we see Al Qaeda, but even though we topple down Al Qaeda, it doesn't mean that we can't completely eradicate terrorism because you know, as long as there is me, no security in the Middle East. But secondly, we think Assad will incentivize the Sunni, uh, incentivize uh, uh, Sunni to to uh, to get into ISIS because Assad is genociding uh, Assad is here and then they, they are genociding Sunni right now. For so this this situation incentivizes Sunni to participate in ISIS in order to bear up, in order to protect themselves. Because as long as they are not going to belong to ISIS, they have a possibility to be attacked by Assad and by Syria. We think this, without this, is, as long as you admit the uh, existence of Assad, this, this situation allows you to in, uh, incentivize you to uh, participate in ISIS. So if you believe that. Uh, Talking down the problem ISIS, it's so important. We have to cut the root of causality of emerging ISIS. Because the reason behind, the reason why this ISIS emerged in the past was because Assad made insecurity in the Middle East. Assad incentivized you to participate in ISIS. And that's why the policy face we're very proud to oh. Thank you for the Okay, we recognize that like Assad the top and down the Assad regime is become something important in this day. And this is what you may have to explain in his speech. I want to talk about why the, the prioritization of the ISIS is actually important to the lead to the ceasefire of the uh, Syrian civil war. This is our point in this day. So I want to talk about two issues in my speech. Firstly, about the, prior, the problem prioritization, which is more important in regards to the Syrian civil war and also terrorism. And secondly, I want to talk about how we lead to like, the ceasefire. And this is crucially important in this debate. So firstly, about the problem prioritization. What we heard from the uh, opening opposition is quite simple. There are many casualties. That's what we need to prioritize the, the bring down the Assad regime. That is too simplistic. Because in order to like to solve that problem, we need to more we need a more efficient the proposal to lead to the least in more likely way. So we think that our proposal is something that uh, something that achieve that goal. Why? What we heard from the opening question in the other uh, alternatives is the support like anti like the Assad regime, and they didn't explain why that works. Because the currently the, those kind of the, uh, the anti-Western, uh, the anti-Syrian regime, the hard uh, not the local regime, uh, the Syrian group, the anti-Assad group, the hard problem in the, the fighting against like Assad regime. Because obviously the Russia, uh, the, not Russia, but the uh, the, uh, the, the Russian military uh, uh, mistake, they mistakenly bombed the certain important places at the strategic point for like those like anti. Assad regime. For instance, if we look at the case of the recent case of the Russian bombing of the oil plant or like the truck of the oil plant, 
those kind of things is actually crucial important for those anti Assad regime. But the Russia does kind of do those kind of things because they see the benefit as they concede in the Assad regime. And we think that the actual situation is actually the bad thing. And we think what we need to in this instance is to at least the compromise of Russia. And in order to induce that compromise, we are going to give a certain compromise in exchange for that. And that I want to you in my second issue. But secondly, it also undermines the military operation, uh, military operation in Syria because it, Russia independently the act without the interest. Uh, the, 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 the Russia's interest or the Russia's act is, does not align with the West. What is the, what's the manifestation of that? We think that it creates the political opponent to uh, with the political opponents to the Russia. That is uh, like countries like the Turkey. Those actors that, that, that near the, those actors which is near to the Syria is actually crucially actor in this circumstance. But for the in providing like a military basis or in providing the military like a corporation in Syria. But if we have the like, independent act of Russia and we think that the Turkey is a crucial actor in this debate because they have you know, that Russia and Turkey have the political tension because over the, the over the long years. When we need to look at this debate is the compromise of Turkey and the cooperation with those countries in order to have a more efficient like, military operation in Syria. We think that it's the status quo that actually created the political tension between those countries because of the people in the Turkey see the Russia as something that created the doing the air bombing in the important places for the Turkish people, like the like bombing the Turkish family and all the uh, all to us. Yes, opening. So if you are going to we can't make a peaceful war when we shake hands with the most uh, more country which has the most tension, right? It's suddenly I, I don't think that's a realistic Yeah this is what I'm gonna explain the second issue. So how do we leave that the final the, how do we actually lead to the like, ceasefire or actually lead to the co co cooperation with Russia? What is the interest of Russia in Syria war? Is that the <laughs> is getting money from the bond and selling the, uh, the arms to the Assad government and having the political allies in that field? Because they are obviously the influence of the West. So what we see, what we should do in this circumstance is the compromise of the influence of the Assad and the influence of the Assad regime by the toppling down like the, by tapping down with another person who has like Western influences. So what we should do in this circumstance is to like, hold a ceasefire negotiation between anti the Assad regime, and also uh, not regime, anti Assad groups and the Assad regime. We think this is actually crucially important, more than just the influence of Russia for the West, because we think that there, there's a obviously the casualty which is increasing right now. We think that what we, this is what we should prevent as the Western country, which is, which is respect the people's liberty or the happiness. We think this, this is actually crucial, this is important in this debate. And that's why even if like, we compromise a certain influence on the uh, Assad regime, we think that's a good thing, because this is what the West should prioritize in this circumstance. And we think it also leads to the situation where the Russia the compromise or the cooperate with those countries, because they don't see the like, threat from the Western countries, because they do not, they do not have like such a political influence over the West because this is the condition we have the same ceasefire, the talk with uh, the talk between these two parties. But secondly, we also decrease the tension between the, the Turkey or those kind of like, neighbor countries, which is, which is uh, neighbor countries to the Syria. That means we can also decrease like, the tension between the Russia and the, the, those countries because there are obviously less tension between the, these two uh, these two parties. Yes. Do you have any example of precedents in which United States making concession or compromise against ideologically opposite countries like United, uh, China or North Korea as a result of which they made a successful concession or negotiation or intervention? Sorry, could you explain that again? Do you have any example of that, you know, United States making compromise or concession against China or North Korea or any ideologically opposed country that they can make a successful negotiation and intervention as a result? Oh, it's not necessarily the ideological opponent, Mr. Speaker. Because we think that the, what country Russia they had the, for proven is like the invasion of NATO to the near, near countries to Russia. And that kind of military influence is actually the, the, the interest of Russia. We think that those kinds of could be the way allowed, could be the same, uh, could be in the interest of the West. Because they do not necessarily have to the send the military to the Syria. And that's an important point in today's debate. So what I have told you today, 
is that in order to solve the issue of the ISIS and more than that, the Assad regime, we think that what we need to do is to solve the problem of the ISIS or like the, like the military dynamics in the countries. And in order to tackle the, the Assad, we need to have some compromises. And we think this is actually leads to the better situation for the people in Syria and for the world. We think we're very proud. Uh, we're very proud to propose. Thank you, Board Deputy Prime Minister, for assessing this. I'd like to welcome the Deputy of Office to be here. Mr. Speaker, I'm really glad that I printed an article called Next Steps for U.S. Foreign Policy on Syria and Iraq and read it this morning because I know precisely what to say in this debate. So I'm going to extend this debate in one dimension. First, I'm going to talk about how this policy necessarily harms the credibility of the West and the soft power of the West and whether it empowers the propaganda of ISIS and actually increases the power of ISIS at the end of the day. But I'm bored that many independent rebuttals to the entire government. Bench. First of all, opening government seems to assume that the removal of ISIS is a common interest between Russia and the West. First of all, we do agree to a certain extent, but we actually think that the ultimate denial, ultimate removal of ISIS is not really the interest of Russia. Because, well, because, for, because Russia is fundamentally aligned with the Assad regime, and the Assad regime is more afraid of rebel groups than ISIS. Rather, the existence of ISIS legitimizes the existence of the Assad regime by saying that we're fighting against terrorists, or they allow them to bomb or attack, for example, rebel groups, saying that we mistake them from ISIS or things like that. So actually, the existence of ISIS is rather in the interest of the Assad regime at the end of the day. So we deny the extent to which Russia is actually willing to cooperate or fully cooperate in this instance. And we think this is like extremely important because in the next video that I'm going to have to their case. Because they told us that we can cooperate and therefore we can stop like, Russia from bombing rebel groups and they can be perfectly coordinated. We don't think that's realistic. The fact is, we cannot monitor every single bombing that exists in the Middle East. It's not realistic to expect the West to be able to distinguish, for example, the target of the bombings and say that, look, you just bombed a rebel group, when often it's, ex it's extremely confusing, and oftentimes Russia can just say that we made a mistake or things like that. So extremely unrealistic to say that we can completely control the actions of Russia just because we say we cooperate with them. It's extremely unrealistic. It was never given any realistic analysis. Closing government told us that maybe we can create peace in the region because suddenly we're going to be able to like stop the civil war in the Syria. First of all, we think that the existence of the Assad regime is in itself against peace because when the Assad regime uses chemical weapons, yeah. it commits genocide. It's a horrible regime and it's fundamentally oppressive and kills many people on the ground. So we say that ending the civil war in favor of the Assad regime is not something in the interest of the West. It's not the interest of human rights. So actually, that's rather a harm on their side of the house. We also say, secondly, that's extremely unrealistic. Because we don't think that rebel groups are suddenly going to back down just because just Russia and the West are going to cooperate. We don't think that they can ever stop the rebel groups from attacking, for example, the Assad regime. So we think it's extremely unrealistic to say they can create a ceasefire on their side of the house. But certainly we also think that actually it is to a certain extent realistic that we can topple the attack of the Assad regime in our paradigm. Because the fact is so far the West has been extremely reluctant to provide necessary support to, for example, moderate Sunni rebels in the region. For example, it's only sent 3,000 military advisors, which is extremely insufficient. We said significantly increasing the number of military advisors, significantly increase the number of arms that we give to these countries can be extremely effective in empowering these rebel groups and giving them sufficient power to either topple the Assad regime or to give enough power to threaten the Assad regime to get to going, up, going down. For example, we might be able to give them amnesty to have them back down and replace them with a more moderate Sunni government, which is necessarily better from all perspectives, not only human rights, but also, for the, also denying ISIS. We think that's a far more, far more effective response to the Assad regime and the problem in the Middle East. And if we have the political capital to become friends with Russia, we think that this is also capable and it's the better alternative. So that's what we're proposing on our side of the house. Finally, the deputy prime minister told us about political tensions in the region. And therefore, if we suddenly cooperate, we're going to become friends. We don't think that's realistic. Just because we military cooperate doesn't mean we suddenly become friends, right? We said if we want to make Russia friendly to this extent, we're going to have to make significant compromises 
to Russia. For example, we think it's unrealistic to say that, look, Russia, you can't bomb as you want. We're going to monitor every single bomb that you're going to send. We're going to monitor all your military strategies. It's extremely ah. unrealistic. If we want Russia to be cooperative to this extent, the West is going to need to significantly compromise their interests and allow Russia to do as it wants. We don't think it's realistic to say that the West can take a strong stance against Russia, but also be extremely friendly when it's fundamentally the West is against the, uh, ha having a solid regime in this circumstance. Before I move on, I'll take a closing. If you are going to explain the harms coming from lack of control over the Russian action, don't you think it's better under our party because we have to some extent control over Russia because we're going to cooperate, don't you think so? Yeah. Okay, we're not saying that the Russia is the root cause of the problem. We're saying the existence of the Assad regime is a fundamental problem. And we say that the West can take a stronger stance against the Assad regime and fund, for example, these groups if we're going to be able to fundamentally say or say that we're going to be against the Assad regime. But I'm going to talk about how, regardless of those consequences, we think that this policy is extremely harmful because of the soft power that's going to be harmed from the West. Because what we say from our side, and this is going to be my substantive extension, but what we say from an opening opposition is that ISIS has to be fought on an ideological front and in the mind of the Sunni modern people within Syria. Because 75% of the Syrian citizens are Sunni. That's why we think that we need to be able to stop these people from participating, for example, in ISIS and going to these places. But what do we think is, what do we think is necessary in order to stop ISIS? First of all, we need to create a sense of security within the nation. Because when these people feel threatened, when they feel that, for example, they have no way to protect themselves, what they're going to do is probably going to rely on stronger forces. In this circumstance, ISIS extremely, ISIS its rhetoric is extremely strengthened because it says the Sunnis are threatened. We are your com we're your comrades. We're going to protect you. Therefore, you should join us. When there's instability, it's fundamentally extremely empowering ISIS. And the instability is one of the root causes why ISIS is so powerful in this certain dimension. We say that when we allow Assad, or when, we, when the West seems weak to Assad, and when it seems to be legitimizing Assad, and these people don't think that Assad can be tackled, that means that these people are going to feel more threatened, even if we, regardless so the consequences. We think it's extremely harmful when we take this soft stance towards the Assad regime, as they're saying. But moreover, we also say that Sunni people tend to think, or the status quo, are thinking that the West is extremely weak, or is unprotective of Sunnis, or is rather negligent of Sunnis. For example, the West has watched 200,000 Sunnis being killed without militarily intervening. It's extremely reluctant to provide military support. Or we already told you, it only sent 3,000 military advisors, which is vastly insufficient. It, it backed away from its own red line when chemical warfare was used, and, the, and Barack Obama said they were going to do something, but it did nothing at all. It seems extremely weak already and unsupportive of the Sunni population. When we take this policy, it makes them seem even more unsupportive of the Sunni population because Russia is fundamentally against these Sunni individuals. Therefore, we think that these people are going to think that look, the West is not going to be able to support us. This feeds anti-West sentiment and further empowers ISIS because now ISIS can then further use the rhetoric that look, the West does nothing for us. The West is negligent towards us. The West is not going to support us, the Sunni people, in any sort of dimension. That's that's why you have to join us in order to tackle both the, both the Assad regime and to be able to tackle the West. That's the sort of thing that's going to occur in their presence. So it fundamentally empowers the rhetoric of ISIS. Moreover, we also say that even if they try to achieve stability in their paradigm, we think that we can. Uh, what their paradigm is going to do is it's actually going to lead rebel groups to join ISIS even more. Because we fundamentally, when you're saying that you want to empower ISIS, uh, uh, empower the uh, Assad regime, it, it, it makes it a whole larger necessity for these people to become more radical, to become more militant, and to be able to tackle the Assad regime, as well as the West is fundamentally against this individual at the end of the day. Mr. Speaker, in order to start stabilize the Middle East, we need to be tackling the Assad regime, we need to be tackling the root cause of the problems, that's why opening the opposition is supremely proud of the folks. Thank you for adopting your opposition for As we can see, it's an ultimate time to such ISIS is so powerful and uh, damage such human beings. 
In, in the sense that we are, we, with our sort of corporations, we never, we never facilitate to the air bombings under, or already doing under, or already done under status quo. It's the main problem of the, with other corporations. How, uh, we, are, we are talking about that even if also, uh, even if we concede the uh, the definitions coming from the opposition side and the Assad uh, controversy kept, however, it, well, it's a better off because it's such a I guess I, it's a very envious in 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 the, in the world uh, in the world it's a it's a common enemies in the world. For this reasons, we we have to support these motions. Three things talking about. First thing is that why Russia is so necessary to tackle with uh, IS, IS and uh, because uh, air bombing is ineffective in in under status quo. Secondly, I explain to why Russia have a some is uh, some uh, uh, have a strong incentive to cooperate with uh, with the West and to compromise uh, compromise in their tactics. Secondly, the way compared, even if somehow the Assad is a very bad guy, however, why it's a better off to uh, better than the other. Uh, other uh, ISIS and some more, um, before that is some engagements. They are talking about Christians. Is a certainly have an incentive to the opt in ISIS. However, their analysis is already under status quo. Regardless of the corporations, already as a the bombings such as Sunni people sure, sure. have been using the rhetoric already. So, however, the, the corporation is not so much emphasized uh, or, than under status quo. Now, uh, the other thing to engagement integrated in my argument. What uh, first thing is that what necessities? The how uh, the question is they they are only talking about the alternatives coming from the opposition side is that the Union Army already air bombings. However, the, uh, the question is how effective air bombing over Union armies is now. We didn't, of course, we didn't suppress such a, uh, the, we didn't suppress the such a armies. The, in, not so much. Why does this? The simply because they, uh, without the corporations of Russia, they 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 uh, such a, such a bombings over Russia decrease the power and the amount of the indigenous ground armies. Because they are, uh, they, uh, they fear they such a, uh, such a, uh, such a, uh, such a ground armies, a uh, uh, ground armies is feel that it's a very anti assados So to, they are trying to uh, uh, use as Russia said, it's a bombing, uh, bombing uh, on the ISIS. However, the weird they bombing are so much amount of over uh, bombings toward such an, uh, such ground armies uh, in their in the Syrians. It's a very powerful. Why is that? That's simply because the uh, such an Indian army is a very important factor to facilitate their uh, uh, their air bombings over the U Union armies. Because they use all such a grand armies and they're making such a uh, such a war to uh, to uh, not to uh, Avoid escaping or uh, such uh, ISIS peoples. Of course, uh, if you try to bomb in one place, however, they try to escape, easier to escape such uh, areas. So they will, so for this reason, with such the uh, air bombings under the status quo is not so effective. It's not so e effective. The secondary is that there is such an injurious army. It's, it's very important. Have a make big connection with the injurious peoples. Uh, for uh, for these reasons, they are easy easy to espionage to find the what is the what is the best spot to correct such a is is uh, executives or what is when uh, or how do you bomb it in in the in the in the process and so forth. And the third is that uh, there are no alter alternatives. They are, uh, because they are such a, uh, such a Americans who have a uh, possibility to touch uh, such that international treaties, so they don't uh, actively their uh, air ground. Armies cannot use. So for us, for this reason, so such a, uh, it's important. And thirdly, it's that the such a monetary incentive. So monetary power and military power and Russia is important. Secondly, is that why Russia have so much incentives? There's five reasons. First is that there's there's already Russia's uh, 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 there's uh, Russia is already threatened by the such a uh, uh, such a ISIS because they uh, such a the uh, IS want to uh, invade is that include such a territory over Russia because they are breaking one psychic psycho uh, frameworks. So secondly is that there's uh, military. Uh, the uh, the uh, military of the ISIS is mainly composed by the such Soviet peoples, so there's much possibility to the terrorism in the Russia. The third is, is that they're in the 
Ukraine wars, they have uh, so, uh, strategically their Russia is isolated in the uh, international uh, communities, so they are less in more incentive to cover the other entities. The third is that, uh, uh, fourth is that events are uh, shooted by the uh, ISIS, so the public opinion is very, uh, very reactive to want to destroy ISIS before that. Uh, or of course, the Russia may have certain incentive to cooperate with the U.S. But the problem is, once you make a concession, the Russia will demand something more in the long term. That unconditional concession is what radicalizes Russia. And that's the problem we would like to specifically emphasize from this side of the house. If you isolate it, it's a more incentive to uh, they're more radicalized because they uh, they use want they want they want to use uh, such that uh, emergency situations. However, the we are cooperating with and more balanced to uh, such the power. Well, that is the best case for uh, our side. Now, suppose there is somehow the cooperate with such a uh, Russia, and uh, uh, the, now we compare the, uh, in the both parties. Even uh, 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 they are talking about is uh, uh, Assad is a very uh, bad, bad guys. However, uh, ISIS is a very emergent program to intervene, the, uh, uh, get a tremendous amount of our territories and so forth. So they uh, more importantly, that uh, the for long, for long the wars they are unnecessary. Majority increase because they're, uh, for example, the soldiers, the Union armies, and the people in the Syria, and so forth. And the uh, important thing about Assad is a better for the uh, Assad, uh, better for the Western. Because I understand that school, they also Assad have a street drink, for, uh, str stronger street drink of the ISIS. So they, uh, so they, uh, because social security will decrease. So the As so now Assad require Russia's help, Russia's help now, the, uh, not only your by all your power. However, after the game proposal, we co we cooperate with such Assad, Assad or Russia, and they recognize the Assad also recognize why cooperation is so important. The thanks to the uh, thanks to the West, somehow they you will get more power under the status quo. How, so they have much incentive to compromise or more incentive to cooperate with the, uh, or uh, stop such uh, more activities done the under the status quo. For this reason, we beg to support. <laughs> Thank you for the member of the government for excellent speech. I'll let's welcome the member of the office. Thank you. Thank you. Necessarily radicalize Russian government and also any other anti Western actor. Two, how this policy undermines cooperation which happens within West. And three, why the continuation of the Assad regime is a condition that the West should never compromise. Before that, and most rebuttals will be integrated, but I have a brief point to a response to make this closing of government. So what they said in their first extension is that Russia has certain incentive to agree with this policy and would compromise. And what we say that even if Russia has some incentive to agree with this policy, the pro specific problem with this policy is the West is the initial actor and the initial actor to send message to the Russian government that it is weak, that it is incapable of dealing with the problem, and we need the help of Russia. And I'm going to further explain this why why this is a problem in my first extension about the radicalization of Russia. But moreover, through the entire government bench, we hear this problem that we need ground force, we need military intervention, and therefore we need the cooperation of Russia. But they didn't really explain why fighting Assad and ISIS is a mutually exclusive thing. We don't think that it is mutually exclusive to both fight the Assad regime and the ISIS. Firstly, because in terms of like military superiority, the collective military might of the West is far vastly superior to the like uh, um, disorganized military faction of ISIS and Assad. But second of all, we also have to recognize that Assad, ISIS, Russia is also fighting each other. So even if the, the, the West doesn't show its full military might, 
These actors are fighting each other and weakening each other. So it's not really difficult if the West commits itself enough to deal with this problem. First issue, how this policy radicalizes Russian government. This policy will necessarily radicalize the Russian government and the Putin regime because this policy sends Russia government the wrong message. The West is too weak to deal with the problem on itself and thus we need the help of the Russian government. This radicalizes Putin, this radicalizes the military political factions which support Putin and moreover this radicalizes the Ru Russian people whose increasing tendency is to support nationalistic Russia. Russia would start demanding other conditions and other um, compromises from the West. For example, the creation of an even greater pro-Russian government in Syria or demand Russian advantageous compromises in places such as Ukraine or Crimea. And with, what we say is that it's not just Russia who's going to demand and become more radicalized and demand things from the West. Actor, Anti-Western actors such as China would also see this policy and would interpret this policy as a message of saying the West, or mostly the United States, no longer possesses the influence and the political military power uh, in order to like sustain order. Therefore, for example, actors such as Ch Ch China would become radicalized when it comes to issue of Taiwan, or human rights violation within China, or the Spratly Islands, ladies and gentlemen. The hard of this, and the reason why this is a harm is first of all, we think that radicalization is harm because it undermines Western interests, but moreover, it decreases the Western influence around the globe. Other neutral countries would see this as a signature of like decreasing Western interests. Increasing number of countries would start siding with anti Western countries such as Russia, such as China, decreasing the political influence that West has over the world. Second issue how this policy undermines the cooperation within the US. Not yet. The problem with the entire government bench in so far today's debate is that they assume that West is somehow a single entity with a single purpose with a shared common value that is so strong that they don't have any internal conflicts with, within each other. Now what we say is that when you really dissect the word West, there are many various conflicting interests even amongst this word West. Like the, in, when you take a look at the political arena in the United States, like many Republican party are actually strongly anti-Russian. When you take a look at the Turkish government, the Turkish government is severely anti-Russia even though they are considered as Western country, uh, especially right now after the, um, uh, the, sh the shooting down of the Russian air, um, air airplane. So even if we cooperate with Russia, this is necessarily going to undermine the cooperation which happens within West. For example, the Republican Party of the United States uh, who would use this anti-Russian rhetoric and would not allow uh, any increasing budget for the US and the United States government to stand on its military budget. For example, the Turkish government would also uh, would have less incentive to cooperate and would allow, allow grand, uh, Western ground force to travel through the Turkish land and would even opt out from this Western influence. The impact of this uh, consequence is that it decreases the efficacy of this policy in the first place because even if we can cooperate with Russia, the Western countries within themselves, the, de the cooperation would decrease. But second of all, it decreases the long term political and military in influence the West in general possesses. Third issue why the con condition of the continuation of Assad regime is a condition that the West should never Absolutely. compromise? Before that, any point of information? Okay, so firstly, the Assad regime is a dictatorial regime that has conducted massive and massive genocide in the most atrocious way imaginable. Assad regime has used chemical weaponry and incendiary weaponry to kill thousands of its own civilians in the most brutal way imaginable. The consequence of this policy is twofold. First of all, it allows the continuation of this genocide and deprives any democratic freedom of the Syrian people. But second of all, it sends a message to the entire world that West no longer stands for the very principle that it, sh it should push. Things such as democratic freedom, things such as the protection of fundamental human rights. But so the second reason why this condition should never be a condition that the West should compromise is because West, mainly the United States, has made a promise to the world that it will topple down the Assad regime and provide liberty to the Syrian people. So if we compromise and if we take this policy, two things would happen. First of all, it sends a message to the rest of the world that West is an actor that would ultimately abandon you and will allow you to be the victim of mass genocide. That the political influence that West possessed would dramatically decrease because it'll never be trusted again. But second consequence is, is it sends a message to the Syrian people that the West is an actor that will ultimately abandon you, has, and has allowed you to be the victim of mass genocide. So no matter what kind of regime we're going to see under their policy, whether it's going to be a pro-Russian regime or a pro-Western regime, these Syrian people will ultimately have huge resentment uh, to the West because they have 
have this history of being abandoned by the West. Ladies and gentlemen, this debate is not just about Syria. It's about the most, more, a more broader implication of this, this policy to the entire global sphere, and that is why this policy must absolutely fall. So what the opening, like entire opposition bench is trying to say is that how Assad is a bad regime and it is necessary for the West to cooperate with each other so that they can overturn the government. Even if we accept their contention that if this policy is going to make Assad regime prolong or comes up again, we think it's still better than the status quo in which thousands and millions of people are being killed and expelled to other countries. Why? Because we think the chaotic situation or disability is the thing that actually bore this institutional ISIS. The next ISIS is much more likely to be born if the war is going to be going on. And we think if we become very, very comparative, we think the possibility of ending war is much, much higher under our party. Because Russia has a better connection with Assad, which means that if the Russia can actually bargain Assad to stop bombing against, for example, ground forces, which are crucially necessary to facilitate the bombing from the Western countries, we think the ISIS problem is much more better so under our party. If we compare the number of casualties that will be caused under their party and our party, our party is much better. That's the tension coming from our side of how we are the only one who specifically analyze the incentive of the Russia. So before my going on to the points, I have a couple of rebuttals against Uchiha Masan. So first he talked, he talked about how this motion is going to radicalize Russia because they're going to feel like they're nationalized, they're going to feel like the West are quite weak. We think that this is a very, very false thing. First, we think rather isolating Russia is likely to radicalize Russia itself. Why? Because if the West comes here and approach that, and if you see, for example, Western leaders and Russian leaders talking together how to cooperate in order to tackle ISIS, we think it's much more likely that the citizens within our, our Russia to feel like they have to cooperate the West or they're not really antagonized by the West. We don't think radicalization rather happen. We rather think, secondly, that if this military uh, intervention is going to occur with these two parties, we think the cooperation among military, maybe for example, Russian military and Western militaries are likely to happen. So from the bottom, we think there's more likely to be a cooperation, and we think that in terms of trust between the Western and Russia, our pattern is better. Moving on to the second issue about how this is going to rather disrupt the solidarity of the Western countries. But they said like how some countries are going to be angry with like actually engaging with Russia. But we think it's not true. Because we clarified in POI that how ISIS problem is a common interest for all the countries, right? If you empirically proven that it, you talk, Turkey and France are also willing to cooperate with Russia if they can tackle ISIS. Cooperation Russia is necessary, they're thinking, to tackle ISIS. For example, if you take the example of Turkey, um, the reason why Erdogan was failed in the first election that uh, recently occurred is because he failed to actually keep the social order uh, because he were able to eliminate ISIS. Or if you see the example of France, we're trying to cooperate with Russia in order to tackle ISIS. It is empirically proven that Western countries do have an incentive to tackle ISIS, and, and if it's necessary, they are uh, happy with cooperation with the, uh, with um, Russia. That's our rebuttals. Moving on to the first issue. So I like to look at three issues in this debate. Uh -huh. Firstly, no, so, no, thank you. Why the cooperation of Russia is necessary to tackle the problem of ISIS. Secondly, I talk about why Russia is not as untrustable actor like the other side have characterized. Thirdly, I talk about compare even if Assad regime is going to prolong why our side is 
better. So moving on to the first issue. So the only like actually example or alternative coming from the opposition bench was we're airbombing, that's fine. Okay, we don't think it's really fine, right? Because when you airbomb someone, we think we need ground forces which can actually like surround the, for example, maybe ISIS so that they we can specifically target the ISIS. So we think that cooperation with the ground forces, people like Kurdistan or Turkish living in Syria is crucially necessary. But the status quo problem is that because Russia is not really engaging with um, I, uh, with the United States or other actors. Actually, Russia is letting these Assad regime to bomb, for example, these Kurdistan or Turkish people. That's actually making the uh, bombing failing, Mr. Speaker. This, um, that's what the exact problem that we have to tackle. Secondly, because the reason why um, they said that they can just increase the amount of military, but we don't think it's really happening. Why? Because actually, the citizens living in the Western countries are feeling that, no, well, thank you, feeling that um, are actually being tired of actually uh, uh, actually feeling that they are less actually incentivized to invest money into the military right now because the Western actually governments are failing to tackle the problem of ISIS. If you can say that we're going to cooperate with Russia and the possibility of us cooperating with the ground forces is going to be higher, we think it's much better for the Western governments to actually persuade the public to so that they can invest more money into the military. We think in that sense, we, Mr. Speaker, their alternative is the only function when we cooperate with Russia. Before moving, I'll take one for opening. Okay, so the root cause of instability in Syria is the existence of oppressive regime assaults in and of itself. But we'll just take our alternative of empowering the Syrian, uh, the Sunni uh, rebel group ground forces okay, by giving them the military support okay, okay. to fight the need is okay. better because okay. of okay. <laughs> to threatening assault regimes to superior military power. We think that actually I is factually wrong, Mr. Speaker. ISIS was actually coming from Iraq, which had a chaos after overturning the dictatorship regime. What they're saying is factually forced. Don't be actually uh, persuaded by his rhetoric. Uh, so moving on to the second issue about the why Russia is not as unsuppressible as the other side explained. So government with like actually opposition whip said how how can we cooperate with an ideologically different partner? But they are living in maybe late 1980s when Russia used to be like Soviet and had a communist party. We are living in a country in a world where Russia is actually democratic as well. They are not really communist anymore. They are living in 1980s. So we think there is a possibility of coercion even when it comes to um, ideology. Then they talked about how, like, then they all, uh, all said how, okay, Russia tend to prioritize the interest of prolonging Assad over tackling the ISIS. But we think it's fine, even as long as they have this incentive to tackle ISIS, we think there's a possibility of uh, Russia to cooperate the Western countries in an efficient way as possible to tackle the problem of ISIS. And my partner is the only one who gave tons and tons of reasoning as to why Russia has a massive incentive to tackle ISIS. We told you how, like, for the most, uh, we told you, like, so many reasons which wasn't really engaged by the outsider house. Please note this. So moving on to the third issue, why Assad uh, is a better, why like having Assad is better than actually having a civil war. So we already explained how civil war is better sold under our pride. They said how Assad is bad because they're like killing people by chemical weapons. Mr. Speaker, let's be calm. This was what has happened in the past, Mr. Speaker. What has actually occurred after the um, UN General um, Assembly, our uh, Security uh, Security Council actually denounced Assad for actually using chemical weapons. After this resolution was passed, Assad stopped using chemical weapons. We don't think that Assad is as irrational as the other side have talked about because he's already experienced this pain from being, receiving backlash from the ground forces. They've already experienced this uh, experience, pain of actually being so oppressive. We don't think Assad is as oppressive as the other side said. But even if that's the case, even if Assad is going to like actually don't like realize democracy uh, uh, by taking this policy, we still think it's fine. Why? Because we think having a voting right is less important to being threatened your own life. And Mr. Speaker, in Syria, thousands millions of people are bloody shedding blood because of this ISIS war over, over ISIS. ISIS is actually damaging the right of female. They're being raped, they're being killed in the status quo. We think solving this problem, tackling together as a world is much better. I'm so proud to propose. Thank you. I'd like to welcome the last speaker of this round of to, to make his case in the And Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, have you even noticed the bizarre premise of the closing government? Their argumentation is like this. Now Russia is air bombing Kurdish ground force. If we can better invoke these ground force, we can better tackle the ISIS, right? But there is no guarantee that just because we make a concession, Russia will suddenly stop air bombing against ground forces in the Kurdish region areas, right? 
the Russia may have incentive to make some concessional compromise, but there's no guarantee that specific policy of use of ground force will be controlled as we want, as the West want, Mr. Speaker, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. The only incentive that she explains is that a fight against ISIS is a common interest. Therefore, Russia will surely agree with us in order to invoke these ground force. But yes, ISIS may be common interest, but the extent of the threat is extremely subjective because the ISIS problem doesn't exist in its entirety. It's uh, profoundly interconnected with other geopolitical issues in accordance with the region, in accordance with the political structure or political relationship or diplomatic relationship among all other countries. Therefore, we cannot make a sweeping generalization that ISIS is a common problem to the extent that all countries will reach exactly the same level of concession or consensus in order to make one specific solidated policy. Not the fundamental premise or assumption of that side of us. Why this rebuttal is important? Because if rebuttal is true, they can no longer prove the efficiency after taking a proposal that they can fundamentally or directly fight against ISIS to the extent that they have described in the debate. Moving on to the clash points. Uh, three clash points. One, what is the West we are talking about in the debate? Two, how does Russia react in a long run? We, they seem to have analyzed the interests of Russia in a short run, but what we extend in a long span how the Russia will get radicalized as a result of this proposal. Number three, the long-term diplomatic implication of concessions and compromise. Let's move on to the first uh, clash points. What is the West? They make a sweeping generalization about the West. We have come all exactly the same level of common interest. We have exactly all similar geopolitical interests against ISIS. No, even within the United States of America, there are so many uh, political divisions between Republicans and Democrats about the budgetary allocation for the mili uh, military strategy to fight against ISIS, to fight against Syria. Uh, even within the Turkey, there are different political divisions. Even within the country, like France, US, Turkey have a different extent of geopolitical interests against ISIS and Syria. Once you make a sweeping generalization about the interests that they have, that fundamentally undermines the cooperation within the US. What's the practical implication of undermining or diluting cooperation within the West? Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, for another necessary humanitarian intervention, these Western countries can no longer reach a quick consensus about whether to make intervention into other countries with another you know, humanitarian crisis, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen. Therefore, the undermining cooperation within the West undermines the operational flexibility that fundamental value that they want to guarantee on their side of the house. For example, even if this intervention is successful, what about aftermath? We need to continue to fight against another, like a local militants or you know, uh, uh, anti-regime re re uh, rebellions in, the, in the Syria or other countries. But that kind of like, military strategy aftermath will be impossible or undermined once we break down the cooperation within the West. That's the first uh, clash points that they didn't really efficiently engage with. But second of all, how does Russia react in the wrong ground? The opening opposition explained that Russia is not trustworthy, but what we analyze is how Russia will react once we make a concession. Then the, the Rinda shall make a five reasons why Russia has incentive to, you know, cooperate with the United States of America. Granted, right, they may have cooperate, but not you know, uh, same level, because they will get surely radicalized in the long run. Russia, there's no guarantee that Russia will continue to behave as benevolently as it is in the status quo. Once we give them sweet candies, that because they can take advantage of our softer and weaker stance. Mm -hmm. But second of all, Miss, uh, Miss uh, okay, go. So, okay. the reason why the Turkish militants who are in Syria, which are receiving money from the US, is being bombed by Russia is because they are anti-Assad. If the Western governments can persuade these Turkish people to stop like being anti-Assad, do you think that Russia will no longer bomb these ground oh, That process of a persuasion is fundamentally ambiguous. Be just because we approach Russia, it doesn't automatically mean that we can sufficiently directly persuade those local people to the extent that they will cooperate with us in order to fight against Assad. That process is fundamentally vague. The response from Pyachan is uh, isolation leads to radicalization, right? Because once we cooperate with Russia, the voters or uh, citizens in Russia think that you know they are being cooperated with the United States. Well, that's not likely to occur because you know once we West approach, 
what the Russian people think is they won this dispute. Yeah. They have a sense of victory. The collective catharsis that is generated by the sense of victory eventually exacerbates or intensifies nationalistic political movements within the Russia because Putin should also have to be accountable or com politically consistent to Russian voters in order to show his power and credibility. Therefore, the Putin has no other option but to uh, you know, make his political stance or diplomatic stance even harder in order to continue to get support from uh, his voters, his supporters in the status quo. The even military factions within the Russian regime will have the same calculation like Putin. Therefore, there is no guarantee that the Russian government will continue to behave as benevolent as it is in the status quo. Therefore, radicalization, once we radicalize Russia, what's the practical implication of that? Russia will demand something more than that, more than this deal. For example, when it comes to dispute over the Georgia or Crimea, in that sort of circumstances, Russia will never ever compromise because now Russia knows that West might compromise, West might make concession. The establishment of a precedence of concession is such dangerous things as it gives incentive to Russia never to compromise for future diplomatic disputes, future political disputes in, when it comes to other territorial disputes. That's why radicalization in Russia is dangerous. Moving on to the final argument, diplomatic implication of concession, Mr. Speaker. The program of Syria and ISIS doesn't exist in its entirety. It's fundamentally interconnected with other geopolitical complexity. Once we, therefore, we should never ever tolerate what Assad has done, ladies and gentlemen. That should not, con therefore, uh, negotiations should not be contingent upon the removal of Assad regime. Uh, once we you know, give this sense of like abundant for local people, the cooperation with the local ground force, as she has it soon, will be harder because local individuals will be. Uh, uh, antagonized once the United States of America allow Assad regime to continue to make a suicide, a, a genocide, or commit you know, atrocity or ferocity to its people. That kind of cooperation with the local militia will be impossible once we allow Assad regime and give political legitimacy and authority to that uh, genocide of the despotic regime we are happy to oppose. Thank you.